thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so, uh, Space of Play is a small indie studio here in Berlin. Uh, I am German, but I work remotely in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, with Spaces of Play, we made a puzzle game called Spirits, which was released on Steam, iOS, and Android a few years ago. And right now, we're working on the future unfolding. It's an action adventure. It's coming out early next year for PlayStation 4 and Steam. And as uh, mentioned, I also run Promoter, which is a web service for game developers to track press mentions and also sending out review copies to journalists and YouTubers and Twitch people. So today, I want to talk to you about how to build a better website for your game. I've been making websites for roughly 15 years. And for this talk, I'll try to condense what I've learned into roughly like 40, 50 minutes. And I'm going to focus on the things that I believe are important to independent game developers. And you can find all these slides at this website. Okay, this talk is split into four parts. The first part is about what to actually put on your website. So your website can consist of text, images, audio, video. Uh, and when you're making a website for a game, the first question you have to answer is what you actually want to put on it. Uh, so to decide what to put on your website, it's useful to consider who the website is for. And you can generally categorize your visitors into three different groups. You have uh, players, your customers, you have uh, content creators, people on YouTube and Twitch, and you have the press. And they all might come to your website to learn something about your game, and all of them have different questions they want answered. So um, you, the website should be the best source to find answers to all these questions. So the players might want to know how does the game look and feel, obviously, like the first thing um, they want to know. And they want to know what kind of game it is. Um, a common question we get about future unfolding, what do you actually do in this game? And then we try to answer that in one sentence. Um, they want to know when the game is coming out. So uh, they want to know the release date, which sometimes can be tricky because you don't actually might know it yourself yet. Um, but in any way, you should make it clear if the game is already available or not. Sometimes it's actually hard to figure out if you go to a website. It's difficult to understand if this game already released. Can I buy this today or is it not released yet? And also what platforms is the game coming out for? And then another very important question is how much is this game worth? So this is uh, not necessarily about how expensive your game is. It's more that people want to know if the value they're getting from the game matches the money you're asking from them and if the value and the price are well aligned from their perspective. So the website communicates uh, the value of your game through screenshots, through videos, through your text. So you have to keep that in mind when you put a price on your game that um, the website is like one of the first impressions people have from your game, so it needs to be well aligned um, with each other, the price and the value communicated. So a press have the same questions as players, plus a few more. Um, they want to know if anyone else thinks this game is worth talking about. Press journalists want to write stories about topics and games that people care about. Uh, they want to know why your game is newsworthy. Uh, if you have like a press hook, if you have a story you can sell to a journalist, something behind the people who made the game, what makes this game special, what makes this game different from all other games out there. Uh, they also want to know who made this game, uh, how big is your team, where are you located, what previous games did you work on. Uh, basic stuff that you should make easy to find. Um, Screenshots, videos, uh, background information, text snippets. Uh, journalists often use text that you write uh, in your emails or in your press kit. And then they either quote you or they rewrite the text a little bit. And they do that because it makes their job much easier. And usually game journalists have very limited amount of time. Uh, and there's a lot of games coming out. Um, and every year, 
uh, it's actually um, <coughs> journalists have less and less time to cover games because game websites make less and less money. So this is only going to get worse, so you have to make the job of the journalist as easy as possible. Uh, and journalists also w might want to uh, keep updates, get updates, and get a review copy at some point. So YouTubers and Twitchers, they also want to know if everyone else thinks this game is worth talking about, so if there's a kind of hype around the game. Uh, they want to know if the game is interesting to watch, so that means specifically how the game looks in motion, but also how the game looks if you watch someone else play the game instead of yourself playing the game. Uh, they want to know if the audience, or they, if their specific audience enjoys this game, um, game developers often think of YouTubers as like one homogenic group, uh, but in reality, each YouTuber has his or her very specific audience with their own tastes um, and their own genres they like. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And uh, YouTubers probably want a Steam key once it's ready to stream. So your website should have answers to all of these questions. Uh, if you don't have answers to these questions, you might miss valuable opportunities because you might have people who come to your site and they are interested in the game, but you're sort of losing them because you're making it difficult to find the information they're looking for. And finally, you have to figure out what are your goals for the website. Um, these are some goals we have with our website. Your goals might be different depending on what kind of game you have. Um, Whatever your goals are, you should keep them in mind when actually building and designing the site. So we try to get players excited about the game. We want to reach press and content creators. And at some point, we want to convert interest into sales to actually make some money. So we're going to show some examples from our website, futureunfolding.com, um, how we try to generate interest. So when you come to the site, we show you a bunch of gameplay videos that are randomized. Um, so give your player a quick first impression. With our game, it looks much better than most, and it looks in screenshots, so it's important to show uh, motion first. And it gives you like a, yeah, a quick idea, and hopefully makes you curious, because it's a game that looks a bit different than other games. Then if you scroll down, we show you a traditional YouTube trailer, which is of course important for most uh, people following games. And then if you scroll even further down, we show you press quotes and awards nominations. Uh, and we don't really describe the game ourselves with text on the website. We use quotes from press and let them describe the game for us uh, for two reasons. First, since they are professional writers, they actually are better at explaining the game in text. Um, but also, um, they act as external validation. Like if Rock Paper Shotgun says, this game looks gorgeous, this elevates our game. Uh, and sort of validates uh, it to a specific t uh, type of audience. And the awards work in the same way. So <coughs> we don't only want to generate interest, we also want to try to capture it in different ways, depending on the audience. On the website, we have a small sign-up form where people can sign up for a monthly newsletter. Um, this is both used by players, but also by the press. Uh, so we send out the newsletter once a month, uh, and we can build up our fan base slowly. Like if people see the game somewhere at an event, and uh, they go to the site, and maybe sign up there. Um, because we send it out every month, we keep the game in people's heads, so they still know it still exists. Uh, and then when we actually launch the game, we can reach all of our subscribers directly. There's no intermediary. There's like no Facebook or Twitter that sort of may hide or like put the put a wall between us and our fans. We can email those people directly when the game is out, which I think is going to be very important for launching the game. Uh, we use Promoter for letting YouTubers and press register for review copies. Um, so if someone sees this game and they want to have a review copy when it's out, they can already register for this now. So it, again, we can send out a lot of review copies a few weeks before release with just one click. So we can slowly build up this interest uh, in press and content creators instead of trying to scramble and do this if all, all <coughs> a few weeks before launch. 
And since the game's in development for like over three years now, it's good to use this development time to build up interest for that. Uh, and then we of course have a press, press kit as well, so we try to make it easy for the press. Uh, to give them the things they need to write articles, so uh, screenshots, video, uh, and text. Okay, uh, part two, how to actually build the website from a technical point of view. Uh, one of the most important things I believe you could do is, or you should do is to make your site load f as fast as possible. This is probably also one of the things that are often neglected by game developers. Um, so if you have a game website right now, this is like the one number one thing you could improve today. Um, if your site does not lost lo load fast enough, you're very likely to lose visitors. Uh, for example, if you have someone who comes to your website um, on their mobile phone, they click on the link on Facebook or Twitter, and the site doesn't load after three, four seconds, that person will go back right to their timeline, they will never visit your site again, and until they see the link somewhere else popping up again. So you lost that person in that moment. And they're not going to write down the URL and come back later. Um, because a lot of traffic comes from social media, which is very in the moment. So it's a very good reason to make your site load as fast as you can. Uh, one way to do that is to make the site completely static, static HTML. If you have simple static HTML, uh, there is no database to query, there's no PHP script has to run on every request, uh, nothing is faster to render than static HTML. Um, and of course, systems like WordPress are really popular because they're very easy to set up, they're very easy to uh, add content to. However, I would argue that most game websites and most game studio websites don't really need a dynamic site. Um, and with dynamic, I mean where you have a content that comes from outside your control. So I don't. I think that things like comments and discussions have a way better home on Twitter, on Medium, or your Steam forums. So you should consider make everything static. If you really, really need WordPress or want to use WordPress, you should definitely look into caching uh, to make sure your site doesn't go, go down whenever you have uh, any kind of interest. Um, so if you use caching, like server-side caching, you can have WordPress and make sure the site is not super slow and doesn't go down. Um, but I would, what I would uh, recommend instead is using something called st static, <coughs> static site generators. Um, so like WordPress, static site generators allow you to have templates that can be reused and to separate the content from, <coughs> from the presentation using templates. And the biggest difference is that all your pages are compiled into static HTML on your local computer. So you work on your local com your computer, you write all the content, you build that site, then you compile it into static HTML, and then you upload it. Whereas in WordPress, you just sort of do stuff on the server live. Most static site generators are open source, so they're free to use. And you can modify them to their own needs, since you have access to the source code. I had water, that's why I, I swallowed the water too fast. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to show you three different um, popular static site generators. The first one is called Jekyll. It's written in Ruby. It's developed by GitHub and integrates nicely with GitHub pages where you can host your site for free if you want to. <coughs> Another open source project is called Middleman. This is what we are using for our website. It borrows some concepts from Ruby on Rails. So if you, have worked with <coughs> if you have worked with that, it will feel very familiar. And there's another alternative that's very popular. It's called Hexo. Uh, that is based on Node.js. So if you prefer JavaScript, that might be interesting for you to use. <coughs> Most um, static site generators support something called asset compilation out of the box. With asset compilation, you can automatically remove white space from your code and combine multiple files, uh, such as CSS and JavaScript, into one single file, which means um, you will have fewer requests to your server and smaller files, which will make your site load faster. Another thing you can do is called lossless image optimization, uh, where you basically run uh, a, a free tool 
uh, that compresses all your images, but it compresses them in a way that you don't see any difference between the original and the compressed image. They will just be smaller, but they will look exactly the same. So this is a <coughs> very easy way to in decrease the size of your site by like 10%. And there's a free tool for the Mac called Image Optim, and there's many other tools for Windows and Linux as well. So if you just Google for lossless image optimization, and there's no downside to this, uh, this you have to just run this once for, on all your images, and the site will load faster. <coughs> In some cases, you will want to try to manually optimize image sizes. Um, the very useful tool for that is Save for Web in Photoshop where you compare the compressed version of your image with the original version, while you try different compression settings. You can try out like uh, what JPEG compression you, you want to use, for example. Um, and when you export your screenshots, it depends a bit on your art style, if you should use JPEG or PNG. Like a general rule of thumb is that if you, if you have a pixel graphics, you want to use PNG and JPEG for everything else, uh, for, <coughs> excuse me, for all other graphical styles. Another way to make your site load faster are something called content delivery networks, also called CDNs. Uh, what they basically do is they put your, the files of your website in different locations. So if you're looking at the website from here in Berlin, um, the files will actually be served from a server here in Germany. If I would look at our website in the US, uh, the files would be served from a server in the US. That means that the distance between your computer and the server is shorter, and the, that means the site will load faster. And there are a few different providers for this. <coughs> and a popular one is Amazon CloudFront. Uh, we use Microsoft Azure CDN for our site. There's another one called Fastly, and there are many more. Um, but this is uh, definitely an interesting opting to make you know, just have the same files, but put them into different servers on the, over the world um, to make your site get to your visitors faster. Uh, another important point is that you should make it easy to share your game. Um, there are many people who might be enthusiastic about the game and they want to spread the word about it. And so you should make it, make it easy for them. You should not waste people's time and make it difficult for them to do that. Um, there is something called Facebook Open Graph, which is a bunch of meta tags that you put into your HTML files that define what happens if someone shares a link to your website on Facebook. So you can define what title the link has, what image should be shown, what text should be shown. So for our game, it looks like something like this. So with the Facebook Open Graph meta tags, um, it's just a bunch of HTML. We can define which image we want to show. Uh, so you have control over that. We can define how the game is called and have a short description. <coughs> this, you can do the same for Twitter, with Twitter cards. Uh, and Twitter cards are a great way to show off your game in a very visual way, right to people's timelines. Uh, and one thing I would recommend is to use different images and descriptions depending on which page or subpage you're linking to. So in this example, on the left side, we have um, a link to our main website to the game. And on the right side, we have a link to a blog post that goes into the, some of the uh, goes into the details of our technology we're using. Uh, so we have two different images, with two different descriptions, uh, which just makes it nicer. If you share stuff, it's you're not uh, sharing the same stuff all over again. You have like variety in the things you're sharing. Uh, you should make sure that every image about your game should be easily saved savable with right-clicking on it using save image as. Uh, sometimes people put uh, big images into CSS backgrounds. And the problem with that is that it makes it really annoying to actually save those images onto your phone or onto your computer. Um, which sometimes, if I see a cool game and I want to share it on Twitter, I try to do that. Uh, and then it makes it really hard for me to actually put an image onto my Twitter or Facebook post. Uh, so you should try to make sure that you can save images easily uh, and share them. Uh, it's important, I believe, that if you have a website and you have uh, URLs, that you keep them alive. 
So for example, if you have a blog, uh, and at some point you decide to redesign your blog, or you move to a different service system that has like a different structure, uh, if you don't migrate all the existing URLs, all the existing uh, internet addresses, then people who click on an old link will basically get an error message. So uh, I think it's important that if you ever change your site, that all your old links should still work and forward to something that makes sense in the context of your game. And a very easy way to do that is to have something called a HD access file, where you can define different rules for that. I'm going to talk through some quick hosting options for your website. Um, these are some I can recommend. Of course, there are many more out there. Um, if you want to host the site for free, you can use something, you can use like GitHub pages, where you basically host the source code for everyone to see of your website, but you can also host the actual website there. Uh, it's very convenient. Um, if you can also use um, something called Microsoft BizSpark, which is free for three years if your company is less than five years old, which is something we did. Uh, so you basically get a server for free for three years then you can either go somewhere else or you can decide to stay there. Um, there is Heroku, which is very easy to set up and maintain, um, but you pay a little bit of a premium for that. Um, you can have Linode, which is a great value if you want to host multiple sites and you don't really mind maintaining the server manually using the command line, so it's a bit more technical. And then you could also decide to host to complete the whole, your whole site on a CDN, something like Amazon S3. And then you pay per use, basically, which is a bit harder to calculate how much you're going to pay. You don't really know until you pay the first monthly bill, basically, uh, but it's generally pretty cheap. Um, you should think about if you can automate a way to upload change to your website. Uh, usually, when you start out, what, what you usually do is you upload changes manually if you're using FTP on the fly. But it's very error prone. It's very easy to mess up your site but if you upload it with the wrong file to the wrong folder. And then basically, then you're confused where the site doesn't work anymore. Um, so, if you want to use FTP, you should look into something called F automatic FTP sync, which is most client support syncing between your local files and the server. Uh, in my case, I've used uh, a client called Transmit for the Mac, and there are many other clients out there for Windows and Linux. But basically what it does is they make sure that the hours have parity between your local version of the website and the site on the server. Uh, there's an even, even better way to deploy a website, which is, which is a Git push. So some services like GitHub Pages, Heroku, or Amazon, uh, excuse me, Microsoft Azure, allow you to push new a new version of the site via git push command. And once uh, all the new files are up, it, it automatically serves the new version of the website. So they will, the, your, your site will never be in a state of limbo when, when you're still uploading the files to the site and some files are old and some files are new, that will never happen. And this is a much better way to upload your changes because you never miss a changed file or upload into the wrong folder. Uh, you should worry about security if you have a website. Uh, you should use version control. Uh, it's good, very good to be able to go back to previous versions. If you, if you mess up something, you can just go back one step and then upload the old version. And if you use servers like GitHub, you also have like an offsite backup of your, all your code. So JIT is a generally good choice for web development projects. You have to make sure that you don't store any passwords or API keys in your actual source code, because if you do that and someone gets access to your code, they also have access to all your server. So you have to keep that separate from your source control. Uh, don't reuse passwords, ever. Uh, you use something like one password instead, where you have a password manager that does the password managing for you and use two-factor authentication where possible. So if you log into a website, uh, it will, for example, send you an SMS on your phone, like another authentication code, or use something like a Google Authenticator. 
uh, make sure to never use FTP, only use SFTP, because FTP sends your password over the internet in plain text. You don't want that. And if you're using a popular framework like WordPress or Ruby on Rails, uh, it's really important to install security patches uh, as soon as they're released. So that means on day one. Otherwise, anyone can take over your site, uh, basically with uh, a zero day exploit. Uh, and this is a bit annoying and time consuming, but getting hacked is worse. And there are lots of cases where independent game developers have been hacked because they have not installed security patches. OK, let's look at some code. This is, can you see this? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we use a middleman for our websites, uh, which is the Ruby open source framework. And in Ruby, you have a gem file that specifies what libraries you're using and which versions of the libraries you're using. Um, so we use a middleman. Um, there is a thing called live reload we use. With live reload, you can make changes in your code and you can preview it in locally in your browser. And when you save a file, it will detect the change and will reload the browser automatically. So you don't have to sort of go back and forth and like press the reload button manually, which is really nice, especially if you like doing things like CSS changes and they want to see how the changes look. So it makes your workflow much faster. So live reload is something I can recommend installing. Um, here we also use two CSS frameworks called Bourbon and Neat that give us some like basic defaults for CSS. And we also use a gem called Builder to create the RSS feed for a blog. Uh, here's how what a blog post looks like on our company website blog. And this is what the blog post looks like in Middleman. So we have a separate we have a separate uh, markdown file for a blog post where we can define the title and we can f define the URL, what date the blog post was released have different events, uh, different tags. Uh, we can define the layout, the offers. And then we have also, we define the description and the image we're using for social media. So if someone shares this on Twitter or Facebook, we can show this specific text and this specific image um, there. And then in the bottom, this is the beginning of the blog post where we have the actual text of the blog post. Um, here we have the same website. This is our company website in two different screen resolutions. On the left side, we have a resolution that represents a phone. On the right side, a laptop size. Uh, and then HTML, so the HTML for the, both these is exactly the same. And we use something called media queries to define special display rules in CSS for certain sizes. So for example, you see there is a comp small company logo in the bottom left corner on the laptop size. And here in this code, we have the include media statement, where we basically define, we don't want to show the company logo on mobile phones with a certain width. So the size is exactly the same, except that we have some few special rules that um, define the exceptions, how we want to show the site in different um, resolution. And the advantage of that is that we don't need to do like two different versions of the site. We don't need to do like two different for HTML files, just one for phone, one for laptops and desktops. Uh, videos like YouTube and Vimeo, they're a bit more complicated to automatically resize to the screen size of your visitor. And for that, we're using a jQuery plugin called FitWidths. This is just yeah, one line of code that we can add, and then all videos will automatically rescale to the correct size. Uh, since we're based in Berlin, it's easy for us to do our press kits in two languages. So of course, you should have English, English, but we also have a German version of a press kit because we also want to make it easier for German journalists to reuse text blocks from a press kit. Um, and it's really easy to do that in Middleman because it has support for internationalization. You can see here that we put all the strings, all the text into a separate files and separate locale files. So at the top, we have a file called de.yaml where we have things like Pressemappe, Grundlegende Fakten, 
And then we have the English version of that file where things are called Prescott, basic facts. So we can move all the translations into different files and it's really easy to maintain that and to offer multiple languages for Prescott. Um, before middleman, we used WordPress for a blog, which had a different system for how the URLs are composed. So in middleman, we could remap URLs with the proxy command, looks like this. So you can see the first URL was basically how a blog post looked for on our old blog on WordPress, and we want to make sure that when we did the redesign of the website that all the old links still work, so we proxy them to the new path. This is how it looks in middleman because it has like a different structure how the URLs are composed. So anyone who clicks on an old link on like a forum for a few years ago will get the same content but in a new layout basically. And if you don't do that, then uh, your visitor will basically get an error message this site doesn't exist, which is bad. Um, in middleman, you have a config file where you can define different things for your production environment. Uh, we have one config that's called asset host where we define that all images, JavaScript and CSS, should be served from a content delivery network to make it faster. We use a Microsoft Azure in this case. Uh, there's another option called asset hash, which adds a unique identifier at the end of each file. Uh, if it has been changed during compilation, so we can cache it on the CDN. So CDNs usually work like that, that you upload a file and it will be cached indefinitely until you invalidate the cache. Um, and if we give the file a different name every time the context, context changes, so let's say you have a screenshot but you want to replace the screenshot because something is wrong, then middleman will realize this file has been changed, it will give the screenshot a different hash at the ending of the file name. Uh, and because of that, we don't have to worry about cache invalidation because you're just showing a different file that doesn't have nothing to do with the old file, technically. So I pitched this talk to Maze as a workshop originally, and they said it might be better as a talk, so, but I still wanted to have some time for questions and or live demos. So if you have any questions about all of this or if about anything else, related to web design or development, let me know and I will try to answer them now. Yes? For the which which one? Yes. Just just say stop. <laughs> uh, this one? Ah, oh, you mean the f Sorry. You mean this one? Okay, sure. So yeah, there, there was Jackal, which is very popular uh, by GitHub. It's, I think, one of the first site generators. Yeah, so exactly. So if you want to use GitHub Pages to actually host your site, everything is public. Um, yeah. You could, uh, of course, if you don't want to post, if you, if you just want to use GitHub for version control, you can make it private, of course, if you pay for it. But if you want to host it on GitHub for free, then the source code is public, yes. Um, this is why you should also, another good reason to not put passwords into your source code. <laughs> yes? Uh, which, which ones, for example? Yeah, I mean, uh, spray spray is pretty good, I think. Um, it's a good... I mean, it depends a bit on your comfort level. Um, I mean, uh, the, the reason why I recommend doing static site generators is because that if you make a game, you usually have some kind of technical knowledge in your team. Um, and once you get over the... Like if you make like one website, it's not so hard. Like once you get, you know, once you gone through the process of making one website, it's not so hard anymore to do it yourself. It's it's not like really rocket science. Uh, but of course, you can use things like Spec Squarespace to um, save some time. I mean, the the main reason we do all this custom stuff is that we can do very specific things um, 
that sort of align with our marketing strategy or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, if you use something like Squarespace, um, you can get up something fast really quickly that looks good, um, but it gets harder to do something very customized. Um, so yeah, it's a trade-off basically. But um, if yeah, if you if you don't want to do it yourself, yeah, Squarespace is a good option. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we have Google Analytics on our website, yeah. And that's also why we have this um, little, let's see if you see it somewhere. Yeah, you see there's a, like a disclaimer down there, uh, which is required by European law to say that we use analytics. And then you have to press OK to say you acknowledge that. Every, yeah. Uh, no, we have not tried to do that yet. Um, we might do it in the future. Um, I'm not sure what we would. I mean, we don't have anything to sell. I mean, we like we have some. Our current game has been in development for three years, so it's not available for sale right now. So I guess it's hard to test if you don't have anything to sell. Like it makes more sense to test if you to, to test conversion once you actually can sell something, I guess. Yeah. Yes. A green footprint. Uh, there are uh, hosting companies who sort of specialize in that. So uh, I know they exist. I can't tell you one. I, I know I've, we had one previously. It was called Brightbox in the UK. Uh, that that were cl claiming to be uh, climate neutral or like car carbon neutral. Uh, so there are companies that um, focus on that. So we, yeah, you can definitely find those online if you're interested in that. Yes. Um, we, we haven't used HTTPS for our public websites, no. Um, mainly because they're static. Um, yeah, but it, I mean, HTTPS is still fairly complicated, unfortunately. It would be nice, it would be easier to just like turn the switch on and pay for it. It's still pretty complicated. Um, so we have, I have HTTPS for a promoter, for example, where that's actually data saved, um, but we don't have it for public sites right now. Yeah. Yes? I mean, um, it depends a bit, I guess. Uh, it, it's so, like we don't we don't look at it so often. Like sometimes we see something is broken, then we try to fix it. Uh, but you can use Google Analytics basically to look at what people are using, and then you know the percentage, and then you know you can decide for yourself if it's worth it or not. Uh, it takes a lot of time to make its size stuff work on older browsers, but yeah, if you can do it, I guess you should do it. Depends a bit on this, how how the site looks, like how the layout works, how easy it is to make it sure it works everywhere. Yeah, I but I think what I think it's more important to make sure it works well on a phone. Like uh, that's way more important because more people are consuming your website on a phone. Just you know, uh, being in the subway, reading Twitter or Facebook in the morning or or in bed. Yes. Um, we did, I don't think, don't, don't think we had that problem yet. Um, we don't really have a policy. <laughs> um, I guess, I guess if uh, we, if it would if it would be like a bandwidth problem, we would probably take down the image or, or contact the people. Um, we don't have we didn't have the problem yet with that. I think. Um, yes. Yes, of course. There. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, no, what we don't do that because what we try to do with native social media posting. Um, so, for example, on Twitter you have to you have a your character limit, so you have to sort of be very brief and very to the point. But on Facebook, I can I can actually something some, sometimes I write like two tweets on Twitter, but only one Facebook post because I have more room to actually write longer text. So we try to adjust. We try to not cross post because uh, you sort of lose some of the um, like expressiveness of each platform right so it's i think it's better to take the extra time and just post the link on both platforms but like post it in a way that the text for example is the right length for each uh, channel yeah uh, what about newsletters uh, what we are using or Uh, so what we, we are doing, um, so we have a sign-up form on our website um, where people can sign up, um, and we use something called Campaign Monitor, which is a paid newsletter sending service, uh, and we send out a newsletter every month. Um, I can quickly, I can quickly show how this looks actually. Let's see if I have good internet here. There you go. So we have this is a web we this is our archive where we archive all the new sets. But if you click on this, this will open. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good point. All right. So this is what our one of our new sets looks like. Um, so we we this is about the maze, for example. We wrote, hey, we're going to a maze. Um, we email this every month. There's like roughly, I think, 1,500 people on that. And so we're slowly building it up um, every month. Uh, so we hope that when we release the game, we can e reach all these people and they know the game will be out. So we have to can sort of try to build up this launch hype when the game is actually out. More questions? Um, so what what we do? I can quick, try to quickly show this as well. See if I'm logged in here. Um, so we use uh, Promoter, which is a service I developed. Um, and in Promoter, we basically look for the email address. So like sometimes, I mean, some people who tr usually most people don't just try to f send many requests. And you can see, usually see that the email address doesn't, does not match up the channel they are claiming to be, because it's like some random weird email address that doesn't really, you know, you can sort of see yes, it looks really fishy. Yeah, for YouTubers. Like, well, so there's, there's two ways. Like sometimes, so, so here we have, okay, this is our press request thing. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> here we go. We should just, can I mirror this maybe? Okay, let's do it like this. So here, this is like this is how this looks for us. Um, but like, if I find someone, that I can use this icon here, and then I can block this person. Um, so if I see like an email address that is that looks wrong, um, that I can block this person, and this person doesn't know he or she is going to be blocked. For them, it will look the same. They will just get a oh, thank you for your request. But um, every future request, because usually scammers try to send multiple requests over time, you know, like they, they request a key uh, and then request another key one month later for the same email address. Um, so then, that once you block it, once you identify a person and you block that person, you will never get a request for them again. So you use a, a service like this or a system like this. Um, and the other thing we're doing is, if you actually have a YouTube channel, you have to identify through the YouTube API. So you have to, you have. To so if it's a YouTube channel, um, you have to do that. Um, s people still try to impersonate like journalists, um, but yeah, that's like one way we try to do that. Um, so we have some systems. Um, I also wouldn't maybe worry about it too much. Um, I, I would be more worried. Like it's, I think the thing to look out for is like if people ask for menu keys, like if they say 
they are, you know, like uh, I have a Steam group and I want to do a giveaway, then you really have to uh, make sure this person sort of identifies themselves. Otherwise, you're sort of actually losing money because they are going to resell your keys, right? So um, I think if you just have one person who just wants a key for himself, it's not really doesn't really it's not really important if they are like real or not. Uh, we just have to make sure um, to not give keys to people who resell keys, right? That's really the only thing to think about. It's Um, the, I, the, this depends on your specific game, I guess, right? Um, like, I mean, some people, some people do special builds for review copies, and some people just send a release build. You know, um, this, this sort of, yeah, from game, different from game to game. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you so much for coming today.